This Almighty now be recorded. and eternal God, we thank Thee for the wonderful privilege that we have around Thy word of truth this day. The opportunity for us all in difficult times, with all our difficult lives, to see the glorious hope which Thou hast given us in the pages of Thy word of truth. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that we can be together in our homes by the technology available today, that we can consider thy word of truth. And we pray for wisdom and understanding. We pray that thou wilt help us to behold wondrous things out of thy word, that we may be built up in our wondrous faith. Heavenly Father, we pray that thou wilt strengthen us to grasp thy hand and to accept the hope which thou hast extended to all mankind, that we might be able to have hope, especially on the day when the Lord Jesus Christ returns to the earth to set up thy kingdom and to replace all of the corruption and all of the violence that is in the world around us and the dreadful virus that is spreading throughout the world. Heavenly Father, help us and strengthen us in these days. And we pray that we may escape all that is coming upon the earth and to be able to stand before the Son of Man and be welcomed to an entrance into thy glorious kingdom. So Father, be with us now. Help us to see clearly the way in which we ought to live according to thy word, the Bible. So we thank thee, Father, through thy Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, for all of thy mercies and goodness toward us. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so um, if I could just make sure everybody now turns off uh, their microphones, it looks like uh, we've almost got 100% there, so that's great. Um, Oh, what have I got here? Uh-oh. Oh. Sorry, guys. Sorry, we've got a bit of a problem. Hopefully, I don't know what's happened here, but we've, uh, oh, hang on, we've got contact. That's all right. My, my system updated um, in the last day or so with a whole new platform and it's doing some pretty crazy things. But hopefully you can all see that. And um, so, so just uh, again, in terms of being able to see the presentation, um, if you turn off your mic, uh, turn off your cameras as well, I think you'll find that your some of your screen, uh, screens are trying to display uh, people's cameras and the screen so if you turn off your cameras i think you'll be able to see the screen better um, and i'll just leave my camera on um, plus that also helps with bandwidth i gather so you might get a, a, a clearer reception all right we uh we are into our th our um, fourth in our series on the name above every name and um just a quick recap we've we looked first in our first session at um, the influence and name of Jesus as it has spread through the world in the last 2000 years and the influence it's had on Western civilization, but also really on, uh, on, on many civilizations um, in the last 2000 years. And even through Islam, the influence of Jesus teaching has been immense. Um, and then we uh, looked really at 
this blessing, which is known um, in numbers, uh, commonly known as the priestly benediction, which is that of the blessing upon, of, that comes from God upon the children of Aaron, and then the priestly blessing, which then is imparted upon the children of Israel. And what we said with that is that the significance of this blessing in Numbers chapter 6 is in, in the following verse, in verse 27 of Numbers chapter 6, that this blessing was seen as the means by which God was actually placing his name upon the children of Israel. And the suggestion that what we've made is the four, part of, four parts of this blessing really make up the whole plan and purpose of God revealed in what his name represents. And so um, just as a recap, we, we've looked at the Lord bless thee and keep thee. We looked at how that related to God's separation of the nation of Israel and the giving them of instruction and law. And the word keep there had the idea of um, to hedge about. It's the same word used for the law. Um, the law make his face to shine upon thee is really the subject of understanding the uh, the teacher behind the law, the person who gives these wonderful laws and instructions which are for life and that develops this theme of um, enlightenment. And so one of our key uh, quotes that we looked at in our last session was uh, this one in Psalm 80, which which is a brilliant psalm because three times in this psalm it talks about um, the Lord make his face to shine upon us and we shall be saved. Um, and then the psalm also goes to talk about in that psalm about having respect unto his vine, which points forward to Jesus as the son of his right hand that he made strong for himself. And if you remember, we looked at the example of Gabriel in that. So what we did was we looked at Numbers chapter 6, or been looking at Numbers chapter 6, and we're looking at the revelation of God's name to the nation of Israel, and we're comparing it with Isaiah chapter 9, which is the revelation of God's Son to the world. So we've looked at the four parts of uh, Numbers 6, the Lord bless thee and keep thee, the Lord make his face to shine upon thee, the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee, and the Lord give thee peace. And we are comparing them in Isaiah chapter 9 to these titles of Jesus. The wonderful counselor correlates to the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The mighty God correlates to the Lord make his face to shine upon thee. And what we're going to be looking at this morning is this connection with the Lord lift up his countenance upon me, which is in the concept of elevation. And we're going to look at the title of Jesus as the everlasting father. And then finally, we're going to look at the Lord give thee peace, which is the peaceful prince. So that's that where we're going in this series is really looking closely at these two uh, revelations of the name of the Father seen in the name of the Son. So these are the two comparisons between Numbers 6 and Isaiah chapter 9. So just still in a recap mode, um, because something else that I've been thinking about, which is becoming clearer, is um, if you remember in our first of our series, we looked at the, the significance of what God names. And we looked at the example of the things that God names in, in the record of Genesis. And I think that um, if we look closely, these four concepts actually come out really um, quite in, in quite an amazing way in God's whole plan and purpose right from the very beginning, right from creation. So his name is revealed and is by his purpose in creation. See if I can show you that. So if you remember, there were five things, only five things that God gave a specific name to, 
and he did so by separation. So um, the importance really was on three names, even though he names five things. Let me explain that. So the first thing that um, is, is highlighted, well, it's not actually the first thing, but two of the things that God names or by separation is land, which comes out of the sea. So um, God says, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let dry land appear. And then he names these two. So one is called land or earth and the other is called sea. Um, this, is, this is God's purpose within the nation of Israel because Eretz Israel um, the land of Israel or the earth is used of Israel because Israel was called out of the sea of nations and God separated them as a people and he put boundaries upon the land just like he put boundaries of so that the sea couldn't come forward on the land God did this with the nation of Israel he gave a covenant to them that they were not to intermingle with the other nations. They were separated from the nations. They weren't to mix with them. So he gave them laws and boundaries. This is symbolized in the old covenant, which is in the word, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. God blessed them because he performed a great act in calling them out. And the idea of keeping, as we said, is to set a boundary. So in the naming of the land out of the sea, we see the first part of the blessing um, in, in Numbers. The second part is that God, it says, separated night from day. And as we said, this is enlightenment. God made his face to shine upon them. And this is really beautifully symbolized in the new covenant that we have in, in Christ because um, well, we will look at it, that God who commanded light to come out of darkness has shined upon us in the face of Jesus Christ. So I'll look at that quote in a minute. But that symbolization, that, uh, like that symbol of light out of darkness is symbolized in the new covenant to make his face shine upon you. The third part is uh, that God names is that he separates and he elevates a firmament from below to that which is above. And this is symbolized in the lifting up his countenance upon thee. And, and this is seen in the new life that we have in Christ Jesus, which is what we're going to look at in more detail. The symbol of a total new relationship which we have because of the enlightenment of the new covenant. Because of the gospel, we've come out of darkness into the light, and now we are ever, uh, going to be elevated into a relationship with the Father. We come into the special bubble, if you like, which that picture has, um, as now part of a new family. Um, Paul talks about being called into the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So there's the next separation that God makes. He calls, uh, separates the firmament and he calls one part of the firmament sky. So you can see this is a development. Now the final part of all of this, oh, sorry, I was, I, I'll come to the final part. Um, I was actually just adding on this part as well. This is just a, a little side. Um, in terms of the establishment of the nation of Israel, it, the old covenant or the Abrahamic covenant was revealed um, because God revealed himself to Abraham and to the patriarchs as Ael Shaddai, which was an instructor, a teacher, has the idea of someone to nurture because they had boundaries and they had laws and he would protect them. Um, that was part of his covenant which is the idea of the Lord bless and keep thee. Um, the new covenant, which was revealed or pointed forward to 
um, really in the time when the nation received the law, pointed forward to the fact that God would be. And, and the whole of the law of Moses pointed forward to Christ, uh, to the end that, uh, and the title of Yahweh was suddenly revealed to Moses about the purpose of God manifestation. So the whole law pointed to Jesus. And this was a title which was made known or revealed to Moses. Um, when we come to the New Testament, and we find that Jesus really introduces a whole new relationship to God, which is unique, and that is of the Father. Every time Jesus prays, you'll find he always talks about um, Father. He always addresses God as Father. And when the disciples asked how to pray, he taught them to pray our Father. And, and what, what I'd like to suggest to you is that is the most incredible title and the most intimate title that has been revealed. And it's a title revealed upon a, um, uh, as part of a new covenant to uh, a group of believers in Christ. So, but there's one more missing that we haven't done as part of the blessing. So watch this space. And we will be talking about that when we look at this again on Monday, which is the Lord give you peace. And that has to do with a whole new name and a whole new relationship. So as we said, we have been looking at, at our last study. We looked at um, how really light shining out of darkness was like the next stage of God's plan. After giving the law of Moses, he then revealed the gospel of Jesus. And this quote here is a beautiful quote in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6. For God who commanded light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So there is no doubt at all that here in Corinthians, Paul is making connection to Numbers chapter 6, that the Lord lift up his countenance or his face upon you. Now we see that face, uh, or, or the, sorry, the Lord make his face to shine upon you. Um, and we see that in the story here in Corinthians of um, the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. All right, so now we want to look at the next part of this blessing. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee. So one is the revealing of God's glory. The next part is the elevation of God's glory, the lifting up. And if you imagine, you know, like the children of Israel, they, they understood this story, as we said, because of Moses, because they saw the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But, you know, Moses received that glory in the mountain with God. He could have stayed up the mountain and Israel would never have seen the face of the glory of God in Moses. It would have just between, been between him and God. But God wanted to send Moses forth to declare his glory to the people. So he lifted up his countenance in the face of Moses and sent him forth amongst the people and really that's the gospel isn't it because here in second corinthians 4 verse 6 if we see the glory of god in the face of jesus christ and that glory becomes manifest in us there's no point sitting at home in our bubbles on our own we still have to go forth and shine to lift up the countenance of God amongst the people. He will elevate us. So, as we said, this is, I, I believe, um, the counterpart to this is in the story of Isaiah about the everlasting father. For the children of Israel, they had um, two people that they recognized 
as um, fathers of the nation. The first one was obvious. The first one we know, Abraham was called the father of the Jewish nation. He's called the father of the faithful. God called him the father of a multitude. His name, of course, means a father. So Abraham was known all the time as the father of the Jewish nation. In fact, that comes up over and over again in the New Testament, which we'll look at. The other one that was a father to the nation of Israel was King David. And we'll look at that. So he was a father and you'll find references over and over again about um, your father, David. So there were two people. One was the kingly line and one, of course, was the natural line of Abraham, which were recognized as fathers of the nation. In terms of lifting up your countenance or elevating or exalting, that's essentially part of what the name of Abraham actually is. Remember, God changed the name Abram, which means a elevated father or an exalted father, to Abraham, which means a father of a multitude. And there's lots of stuff that goes into this. And I know that Darren would love to elaborate on this. And, um, and I, I'd be really interested to get Darren's feedback on this. But um, he changed the name by adding basically a Hebrew letter to the name. And, and the Jews say in this that this Hebrew letter symbolized like the heart of God. It symbolized part of God's essential character is added to the name of Abraham. So Abraham, as it were, became the heavenly father because God adds, if you like, his heart into the name of Abraham. There were obviously with Abraham, he had a natural seed with the nation of Israel. But there was a promise to Abraham, wasn't there, of something far greater. God sent Abraham out in Genesis chapter 15 and said to him, he brought Abram outside and said, look toward the heaven and number the stars and see if you're able to number them. Then he said, so shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord and it was counted to him for righteousness. Now, what's kind of amazing with that is that when you obviously, um, when you look up and see the stars, we get a lot of light pollution depending on where you are. But when you're in, you know, a desert place like Abraham, it's, it would have been pretty impossible to count the stars. And yet we know by science today, modern science today, um, how impossible it really would be to count the stars because we have these amazing telescopes which can look further and further and further. And the more you look, the more stars you see. And it's estimated that there are more stars, a lot more stars, I think it's to the power of 10, than there are grains of sand on the sea which is kind of mind boggling because you always like I'd always thought that, you know, the, the stars represented, you know, a remnant of faithful people elevated compared to the sand on the sea, which is the great multitude. But in fact, if you look at stars, there's more of them than grains of sand, according uh, to the scientists. But, you know, I'm not really quite sure you might have to take that with a grain of sand. Um, when it comes to naming stars and numbering stars, you'll notice that that's God's job. Remember we said, what does God name and what does man name? Well, God names stars. So in James chapter 1 verse 17, it says, every good and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. And Psalm 147 is a beautiful psalm. Um, there's lots of connections into the blessing of Numbers chapter 6 in Psalm 147. Uh, don't want to really go into too much detail, but something for your homework to go and have a look. Lovely psalm, Psalm 147. But you'll see it says, He telleth the number of the stars. 
So when God said to Abraham, go out and count the stars, it was impossible. Well, Abraham couldn't do that. So God says, it says in Psalm 147 that he knows the number of the stars and he calls them all by name, which is why James calls him the father of lights, because it's a father which gives names to things. So the elevation of the stars and the separation of the stars was part of the blessing which God made to Abraham. It's part of the covenant that he made to Abraham of a, um, a heavenly family, a separation of those that would be called by his name. All right, that's a quick thing on looking at Abraham as the father of um, the nation of Israel naturally and pointing forward to a spiritual family as well. What about David? Well, you get all of these quotes about these different kings that either followed or did not follow in the way of David. And what it says, Josiah did, which was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of his father, David. Now, of course, David was not directly Josiah's father, but it, uh, he obviously was his great, 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 great grandfather. But David is, recognized in the kingly lines as the father by example of which every king was measured against so every king of judah was measured against david and so you find you know um kings like ahaz he said who walked not in the way of david his father um whereas Josiah did, and um, the great prayer of Hezekiah, which is a beautiful prayer found in um, 2 Kings 20 and in Isaiah 38, says where Isaiah is told, go and say to Hezekiah, thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father, I've heard your prayer and seen your tears, and I'll add to you 15 years. So for the nation of Israel in their history, Abraham and David were, were the fathers of the nation. Both of them, of course, were given a special covenant. We talk about the covenant of Abraham or the promise that God made to Abraham and the covenant of David, the promise God made to David. And both of those covenants, we know, point forward to the Lord Jesus Christ. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called the Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So we've looked at the titles Wonderful Counselor in the concept of the Lord bless thee and keep thee. We've looked at the title of Mighty God, showing uh the story of gabriel which was the promise of the coming messiah but now the title everlasting father and the difference in this is that the emphasis in the new testament about abraham and david is that they both died um and and the promise given to them is yet to be fulfilled but of jesus of this child it talks about an everlasting father he will be called an everlasting father by the way what's interesting in this is a lot of a lot of um trinitarians go to this verse of course to uh try to prove the trinity particularly with the phrase mighty god um because they say you know that jesus is god um do you know that everlasting father actually really is a challenge to the trinitarians because even in amongst the trinitarians there is no mixing of the identities of the godhead so so in the in the trinity there is always god the father god the son god the holy spirit the son is never known as god the father um and so for Trinitarians, this verse is actually um, a, a, a real challenging verse. We know, of course, that it's, it, 
it, it isn't saying that Jesus is God, but he is taking on the titles of his father. And we can understand this, particularly in the story of the blessing or the covenant made with Abraham and David. So how does how does this work? Um, just for a moment, uh, look at that quote, uh, if you would, in, in Isaiah chapter 9. I just want to read the next part of it because it's key to where we're just about to go. So verse 6, unto us a child is born, a son is given, the government will be upon his shoulders, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government, and peace there shall be no end it's everlasting that was a real essential part of the davidic covenant look at the next part and on the throne of david and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice with righteousness from this time forward for evermore the zeal of the lord will do this so this is um, this is a promise, which uh, which points forward to the one who would sit on the throne of David forever. Um, whilst you're there, by the way, just before we go, uh, move from our Isaiah chapter nine. If you quickly look back at Isaiah chapter eight, um, verse seventeen, it says. I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope for him. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are for signs and wonders or signs and portents in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells in Zion. Um, does anybody know, by the way, where that's quoted in the New Testament? If you've got a cross reference there, I and the children, verse 18, you can either um, jump on your mic or you could actually first person to type it in the speech bubble. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me. Hebrews 2.13. Excellent. Peter, Hebrews 2 verse 13. Now for a bonus 10 points, who is that a reply, uh, referring to? Jesus. Jesus. Excellent. So so um, this quote, uh, like connection in Isaiah, because Isaiah is all about children with names, isn't it? So it's about it's all about, you know, Isaiah gives his children names which have really important meanings uh, and they reveal God's plan. Um, so Isaiah had a son called Shear Jashub. He means a remnant shall return. He had a son called Malal Shalal Hashbaz, which is a great name, which means hasten the prey, speed the spoil. God has a son called his name Emmanuel, God with us. And then it says, behold, I am the children whom the Lord has given me. And in Hebrews, it's applied to Jesus. So Jesus becomes a father and has children. And this and the children are for signs and wonders. So just thought I'd put that out there because there's a little connection again into our everlasting father in terms of a title for Jesus. Righto. Now we're going to see how the title in Numbers chapter 6 which God blessed or the name that God put upon the children of Israel directly re uh, relates to this name in Isaiah chapter 9 and how they connect together and where we're going to go for this first is Psalm 89 because it's kind of the key I believe to uh to the connection between Numbers 6 and Isaiah chapter 9. Psalm 89. This is a psalm which is very well known because 
here is the psalm of the Davidic covenant. That's a psalm of um, one called Ethan the Ezraite. So here's our connecting verse. Psalm 89 verse 15. In this story about God's promise to David, in this psalm, Psalm 15, it says, Blessed are the people who know the joyful sound, O Lord. They walk in the light of your countenance. Those are the same uh, words which are used in Numbers chapter uh, 6. He will lift up his countenance upon you so these are people that god instructs they see the glory and now they walk in the light of the countenance of god they change the way they walk and the idea of in in number six where it says he will lift up his countenance has the idea of recognizing somebody so, you know, in the story of the prodigal son, the father lifted up his eyes and recognized the son from a distance. From a long way off, the father immediately identified the son. How do you reckon he identified the son from a long way off in that parable? How, how would you identify someone from a long way off? if you can't see their face any ideas how they walk how they walk oh, very good that's two people that said that how they walk quite quite funny you know i was um i was in honolulu airport and amongst the multitude of people and i saw this person walk past and i looked i never saw his face and i watched him and i recognized straight away by the way he was walking who it was and it was a really good friend of mine from Whangarei. many people might might know him dr shane retty he's the national mp but i, I was like no one walks like that except for Shane. So I ran up behind him and tapped him on the shoulder. And sure enough, it was Shane Retty. And this was an amongst a whole group of people. And it's, it's interesting that, you know, um, that they now have um, gait, what they call gait as in a person's gait, how they walk, how they move, um, identification software, recognition software. So, you know, you have facial recognition. So now the Chinese have developed gait recognition. Everybody has their own walk. Everybody has the way they walk. And, and I think that's actually kind of nice because that Psalm says we walk in the light of his countenance. We begin to walk in the way of the Lord when he shines upon us. But I think there's a really interesting thought here is that there's a classic Australian song that I used to play to my kids all the time, which when something like some people walk with a wiggle and a woggle and some people walk with a bend in the middle, some people walk with their toes sticking in, other people walk with their bottoms sticking out. Anyway. Everybody walks differently. And in our walk to the kingdom and in our journey to the kingdom, it might be sometimes frustrating to be walking beside somebody who's lagging behind and walking a bit slow or waddling, who doesn't seem to be able to keep in perfect time with us. You know, like you have those three legged races where you tie somebody to your foot and you can walk together and you find somebody if they're too short or too small and you're too tall it's really hard to walk or run together with somebody that has a completely different stride to you you don't seem to be able to walk in harmony and yet the point is is we all have a different way we walk 
in our journey. And what God is teaching us is that we walk in the light of his countenance and we will walk in our way. And we have to learn to be patient, uh, patient with other people to be able to walk with them and to accept their journey, even if it might be a little bit different to the way we might walk, providing they are walking in the way of the Lord's countenance. It's not for us to suggest that their walk is not correct. Of course, Enoch walked with God and uh, he was not because God took him. And therein is the story of elevation. When we walk with God in the light of his countenance, obviously God took Enoch because he separated him for him, uh, for himself. So that's our first connecting quote. That was a, a long winded connecting quote in Psalm 89 um to uh our connection to numbers chapter six i want to have a look at a few more connections into this psalm which i think are beautiful both into the story of uh numbers chapter six but also into isaiah chapter nine so psalm 89 in verse 24 says my faithfulness and my steadfast love shall be with him that's on this particular son of david um in, in fact it's really interesting that you will find that there's quite a um a change in this psalm that starts often it starts in verse 19 so you will actually see the different tense and in, in in the first 18 verses it's an appeal to god from the psalmist who's crying to god to say bless your people exalt your name make your face to shine upon us show your mighty hand be great O lord and then in verse 19 everything changes it goes back to actually god's blessing and this is the reciprocal blessing that now comes from god so it's almost like god's answer it says i have granted help to the one who is exalted. I have exalted one chosen from amongst the people. So this is the elevation of one chosen amongst the people. And obviously it points forward to Jesus. It's the son of David. My faithfulness and my steadfast love will be with him and, my, and in my name shall his horn be exalted. The Lord is going to lift up his name upon this promised seed and as we said if, if numbers chapter six is the declaring of god's name upon the people this is the exaltation of god's name upon the promised seed of david upon jesus it goes on psalm 89 verse 26 you are my father says the son you are my god and the rock of my salvation which again by the way is interesting if you uh if you've got time you could look at this connection here to the story of psalm 51 where it says look unto the rock from where you are hewn and to abraham and sarah who begat you so there's a real connection here to the rock who begat the nation of Israel, which of course was God as a father. And now is the real exaltation of the name upon the son, which comes again in the very next verse. So Psalm 89 verse 27, also I will make him my firstborn higher than all the kings of the earth. This is the elevation of the son as the firstborn of the father, higher than all the kings of the earth, higher than David. Then, um, oops, I missed one. So I thought I had another quote there. Um, oh. 
Uh, I don't know what I've done with my other slide. Um, there's somebody wanting to say something. <laughs> Try hitting slideshow again on your original presentation. Have you? Hey, can you not see this? Are you looking at my yes. slides, everybody? Yes. Oh yeah. Okay. So that's all right. So um, so. So in in continuation of this promise, um, it says, I will make him my firstborn higher than all the kings of the earth, speaking of Jesus. And then it also says, which I'm just trying to find, where it says, um, yeah, verse 26. Oh, we had that. Yes. He shall, uh, he shall cry to me, you are my father and my God, the rock of my salvation. So this is a, the, in this connection here that um, he is the firstborn and he shall cry to God that he is my father. This is the introduction of this new relationship that we have in, in Jesus in revealing to us the father. Um, so uh, I'm not quite sure why I had this quote here, but um, Genesis 22 verse 17, I will surely bless you and I'll multiply your seed as like the stars of heaven and like the sand of seashore, uh, the seashore and your seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. So here was the promise to, um, to Abraham that his seed would possess the gate of his enemies. So you've seen the connection between that psalm 89 in genesis 22 pointing forward to jesus when you come to the new testament of course this is how you're introduced to jesus the record of the genealogy of jesus the messiah the christ son of david son of abraham but when you go through the story of the New Testament, what you discover is that Jesus reveals himself as greater than David and greater than Abraham. For instance, this quote, John 8, verse 53, out come the scribes and Pharisees to Jesus and they say to him, are you greater than our father Abraham? who died and Jesus goes on to say before Abraham was I am and he reveals himself of course as even greater than Abraham um, when Jesus comes into the temple um, in uh, Matthew chapter 11 it says the people um, cast their garments in front of them and say this is he uh, the the son of David Hosanna to the highest, to the son of David. And um, he's given glory as the son of David and the son of Abraham, but seen as greater than Abraham because he even quotes um, Psalm 110 to the scribes and Pharisees again, where it says, if he's the son of David, how come David calls him Lord? So Psalm 110 is a classic quote, which says, of course, Yahweh says to my Lord, sit thou at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. So this is David speaking of Jesus as being his Lord, as being greater. So even David acknowledged that there was one that would come that would be greater, upon whom the Father commits all the glory. Um, in Matthew, of course, in chapter 3, John the Baptist says, Think not to say to yourselves, you have Abraham to your father, because God is able of these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Later on in John chapter 14, um, Philip wants to, um, for Jesus 
to show them the father because jesus says if if you have known me you would have known my father and philip says show me the father and jesus says anyone who has seen me has seen the father and he becomes the face of the everlasting father the father has lifted up his countenance upon jesus and given him a name above every name which is the same as numbers chapter six to lift up his countenance upon thee so the final words that jesus ever spoke on in his mortality is of course at the cross the last of the seven sayings where he says father into thy hands i commit my spirit into your hand i entrust my spirit and i think this probably is the greatest picture of the everlasting father is what we could see and it comes from psalm 31 verse 5 it's a direct quote and as you go through psalm 31 you will see if you read through it it's talking about being in his hands our times are in his hands it says three times and he says into your hands i commit my spirit and i i always like get this picture really of you know a child who completely trusts in his father and is prepared to let go um self-preservation is one of the greatest you know things that we possess as humans we all know we're going to die but nobody wants to die nobody wants to let go um of of this life and self-preservation is you know this great force within us god said to jesus or jesus said in john chapter 10 that no man taketh the life of the son i have power to lay down my life and I have power to take it up again. This honor has the Father given. God gave Jesus the power to lay down his life. And, and he did so in the psalm. But what's also interesting in this psalm, and I don't know why I've put this here, that should be Psalm 31, not Isaiah 31. But in this psalm, in verse 16, it directly quotes numbers chapter six make your face to shine on your servant and deliver me because of your covenant faithfulness so this picture of the everlasting father at the heart of the story of the everlasting father again is this quote out of numbers chapter six the lord make his face to shine upon thee and the lord lift up his countenance upon thee and the fullness of that would be seen in the resurrection because jesus let go and said into your hands i commit my spirit and he knew that the father would lift him up there are two other con or there's a or one other concept really of this picture of the everlasting father and the lifting up of his countenance upon thee and it's found in the story of the eagle so in exodus chapter 19 god says of the children of israel that he bear them on eagle's wings that's the same word to lift up as in to lift up your countenance and i brought you to myself that's the picture of jesus at the cross into your hands i commit my spirit and the next part of the verse of course says you have redeemed me O lord god of truth you've lifted me up and the promise was the father would never let him fall um again in deuteronomy chapter 32 it says like an eagle that stirs up its nest and that flutters over its young spreading its wings and catching them and bearing it on its pinions 
or on its talons, so have I done to you. And again, that's a beautiful picture of the everlasting father caring for those little eaglets, making sure that they're not going to fall. Um, try as I might, there's a lot of stories going around about um, eagles bearing up their chicks on their wings. Um, I don't think uh, um, there's any video footage of it ever happening, or it's never been observed. Yet, for some reason in this quote in Deuteronomy chapter 32, this is something that it says of God, and it must have been observed back in the day of the children of Israel. Somehow they must have seen this incredible picture of an eagle bearing up its young and catching them and bearing them on eagle's wings. Um, if it hasn't been observed, well, it's certainly the imagery that we have of the love of the Father that will never let us fall, like a beautiful eagle that will come down and swoop and never let us fall. And that's exactly the story of Jesus, of course, when he committed his hands into the Father. So um, those are our connections uh, into the uh, the story of Numbers chapter 6 and um, into our connection of Jesus as the everlasting Father. And what I, what I take from that in terms of our new relationship we have in Christ is that we've been elevated. We've been called to sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We are in his hands. He's committed his care and his trust. And although we are sitting here in our own private little bubbles, his wings are overshadowing us. And I guess the final quote to finish this whole concept of the everlasting father would be Psalm 91. And um, I leave you with this to, to think about. I'm sure you've, um, you've seen this quote many times, but for us right now, in this strange time, we, we have found this amazing fellowship together, but in our own little bubbles, I think it's a beautiful picture of which is found in Psalm 91. He that dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge, my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler, from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrows that fly by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness. Coronavirus has no power over us, brothers and sisters, because we abide under the shadow of the wings of the everlasting Father. May the Lord bless thee and keep thee.